Let's talk about hydroborations. In this particular addition reaction, what we now do is treat an alkene with borane, so BH3. Not to be confused with BH4 minus, that's a hydride reagent, one that we use to remove mercury from the addition, the initial addition product of oxymercuration, demercuration. But in hydroboration, we attack the boron, which is electron deficient, and technically what happens is a concerted process in which the alkene attacks the boron, but then this boron-hydrogen bond rearranges, or rather migrates, to the opposite carbon of that alkene. And in the process, you form an alkyl borane molecule. This is also driven by thermodynamics. The energy of that carbon hydrogen bond is, you know, is better than the energy of the boron hydrogen bond. So this is driven by that equilibrium. And um, kind of like what happened with mercury, the boron, which is the bigger atom between hydrogen, you know, and itself, uh, boron ends up on the carbon that is least substituted or that has the least steric bulk. The hydrogen ends up on the carbon that is most substituted or that has the most amount of bulk. So you end up with this um, intermediate. Now, because the process is concerted, what this is telling us is that the boron and the new hydrogen that we've added are both going to be on the same position, the same side of the molecule. So we call this a sink configuration, right? Because the two things are on the cis uh, configuration of the molecule right on the same side whereas the anti configuration you had things pointing in opposite directions okay now as you can tell the hydrogen is now bound to the carbon that had the least amount of hydrogens and because of that this is known as an anti markovnik of addition now the interesting thing about this process is that to remove the boron and introduce that oh functionality we actually have to use hydrogen peroxide and the I guess simplistic way of thinking of it is that well hydrogen peroxide is going to form radicals and we already saw from the the radical chapter that when you do have radicals although in, the, in that particular case we had HBr interacting with radicals in that situation we ended up with an anti-Markovnikov product and it is kind of interesting that in this case pretty much by coincidence uh, the fact that we have to use radicals to remove boron, you know, kind of allows you to think of that, you know, the presence of radicals as yielding an anti-Markovnikov reaction. Now, the reaction is done under basic conditions. And technically what happens is that uh, hydrogen peroxide is slightly more acidic than water. And so the basic conditions will deprotonate hydrogen peroxide. And now you have this... Uh, monohydrogen peroxide ion that attacks the boron group which once again is electron deficient so you attack the boron and you form this boron oxygen uh, peroxy functionality and then what happens here is that there is a rearrangement because that oxygen oxygen bond is a weak bond right if there are other options for the molecule to rearrange the electron so that you create a much stronger bond it will do so, and, and this is no exception. The carbon boron bond, which is weaker than a carbon oxygen bond, uh, basically tells this molecule, okay, move that set of electrons between carbon and boron over to the neighboring oxygen. But because that oxygen already has a fulfilled octet, what that means is that you have to move the electrons of the oxygen oxygen bond to the other oxygen, in essence, breaking that bond. But then the, the boron, right, the boron that's there um, is now attached to this oxygen. The same oxygen is being attacked by this carbon boron bond. So you actually do produce hydroxide as a byproduct, but you still have boron in the molecule. But this time the boron is no longer bound to the carbon, it's now bound to the oxygen. So you're kind of creating a borate. And this, of course, can happen two more times for every alkyl group that you have bound to boron. So you could ultimately give this enough time, form a 
trialkyl borate byproduct. And finally, treating this with water, maybe under slightly acidic conditions, will basically substitute the alcohols for hydroxide. So you end up making boric acid as a byproduct and you'll produce your alcohol. And because of the process right here happening with rotation, retention of configuration, what this means is that the alcohol that you end up with is also one of zinc configuration in respect to the hydrogen that came from that borane molecule. So not only are we adding the water molecule in a zinc fashion, but we also add it in an anti-Markovnikov fashion as well. And both of those things need to be kept in mind. So if you want the anti-Markovnikov product, um, you're going to be stuck with the same configuration. So that's something to keep in mind. If you want the Markovnikov product, then you use mercury, but then you're stuck with the trans, or excuse me, the anti-configuration. So it's something to keep in mind. Okay, that's the story with the alkene. Now we need to see what happens to the alkyne because that business of tautomerization can definitely um, take a role, you know, and make something happen to yield a different product. So we're gonna we're gonna see exactly what that is. Alright, so right here your alkyne reacts with BH3. And once again the boron will end up on the carbon that is the least substituted or that it has the least amount of steric bulk. And that is the carbon on the right side. That has the least amount of uh, substitution, the least amount of bulk. So what that also means is that your hydrogen will end up on the carbon on the left. So if you look at the product here, we have hydrogen on the left. The borane is ultimately going to be substituted by OH after you treat it with peroxide in basic conditions. So we expect to form this syn product. But notice once again, this is an alcohol that's bound to an alkene. This is your enol. So we can actually undergo a tautomerization. Right, and once again, the solution is basic. So we have the hydroxide attacking the proton of that enol. The oxygen-hydrogen bond moves over to the adjacent atom, which is a carbon. So you form a new carbon-oxygen double bond. And the double bond of the carbon-carbon alkene functionality has to move out of the way so that you don't violate the octet rule. So you end up forming a carbon ion with a new carbonyl, and then that carbon ion can attack the water that you just formed in the previous step, remove the proton, reform hydroxide, and produce your final product. So here what we see is that for the terminal alkyne, using borane in the hydroboration oxidation step, we end up with an aldehyde ultimately. And this is the product that you want to um, write down as your final isolated compound, right? So if you leave it at the enol, you'll get only partial credit in terms of assignments. But this thing right here, if you write the, the corresponding carbonyl compound you're going to get from that tautomerization, then you get full credit. So just keep that in mind. All right. On the next video, we're going to talk about the oxidations of alkenes and alkynes, which technically are still addition reactions, but they now involve uh, removal or addition of extra electrons. Okay, so I'll see you in the next video.